Welcome to Spill the Tea. Today, we're talking to Linda Shenton Machette, an author who loves to write about history, hope, and happily ever afters. So welcome to Spill the Tea. And today we have romance and I believe a bit of a history buff, Linda Shenton. And we're so excited to have her today and her, she has a release called A Love Not Forgotten, which is a second chance at romance. Would you mind if I read the blurb and then you can tell me a little bit more about it? Sure. Awesome. So uh, he can't remember and she can never forget. Alison White should be thrilled about her upcoming wedding. The problem? She's still in love with her fiancé, Chaz, who was declared dead after being shot down over Germany in 1944. Can she put the past behind her and settle down to married life with the kind-hearted man who loves her? It's been nearly two years since Charles Chaz Powell was shot down over enemy territory. The war is officially over, but not for him. He has amnesia as a result of injuries sustained in the crash, and the only clue to his identity is a love letter with no return address. Will he ever regain his memories and discover who he is? Or will he have to forge a new life with no connections to the past? A Love Not Forgotten is a Christian historic romance. A Love Not Forgotten was formerly published in the the Let Love Spring collection that is no longer in print, which sounds very exciting. I can't wait to get my hands on this book just from the blurb. <laughs> yeah, you know, for most of us authors, the blurb, writing the blurb is our nemesis. You know, we're we're novelists. We take 60 to 90,000 words to make our point. And you want me to you want me to mash it down into 200 words? Dense it. <laughs> yeah. If I could do that, I wouldn't be a novelist. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about the book and the main characters? Okay. Uh well, I am you got it right. I'm a history buff. I came to it late. Uh, I hated history in school, but after uh, married life, we ended up outside the, um, you're in Washington, D.C., but close enough to Gettysburg and a lot of those places Mm -hmm. that had um, docents who period, you know, dressed in the period content uh, costumes and spoke and talked about, you know, brought the story. Like reenactments? Yes, there you go. Yeah. And so it wasn't just dates and places and names, you know, so it was, it, I just really got excited about it and started digging into more and more history. Um, when we moved to New Hampshire in 2002, there is a delightful uh, World War II museum here in our town, in our teeny weeny little town. And I, there's a tank that comes out of the front of the building. And so you can't miss it, <laughs> although it does include home front. Most people think it's just military when they first see it. And I became enamored with the World War II era, the the way the U.S. you know pulled together, um, did what they had to do. I mean, there was isolationist bef- before we got into the war. You know, that's that belongs to Europe. That's not ours. We don't care. That's but as as soon as the attack on Pearl Harbor came, people jumped in with both feet and said, "Okay, well now we're at war, so this is what we have to do." and um, and I became, I'm an HR professional by trade. Um, and so I was, I became very, very interested in the, the women's story and how they, you know, society was kind of put on their ear by the fact that these women were taking jobs that were formerly held by men. And yeah. frankly, there are crazy studies that you find. They honestly thought women couldn't do them because they thought their brains were smaller. Or they thought, you know, they, they, the the stereotypes behind things, right? They legitimately felt like they had studied and discovered that. And then these women were like, oh, it's no harder than running my sewing machine. Give me a break. I'm all over this. And just seeing how, and even women who didn't want to go to work went to work because Mm -hmm. the country needed them. And so all of my um, World War II stories feature women in somewhat unusual um, roles. Um, A Love Not Forgotten is actually based in uh, England and it's about the women's land army there. We did have a US women's land army, but this one is particularly set in, uh, in World War II in England. And where I got the idea for the amnesia 
Um, interestingly enough, I was um, watching, and I don't even remember which one, but I was watching a, a sitcom and somebody lost their memory. And it was this comedy of errors. And I thought, amnesia always adds kind of an interesting twist. Let's see if I can do that. So um, so I I got a lot of ideas from all kinds of places. The Land Army idea was from, I'm a big Foils War fan, mm -hmm. which is a BBC uh, series, mystery series, that was done in the, started in the mid nineties and ran off and on till 2007, I think. Um, so lots of different ideas, but that's where my ideas come from is my research and, and from displays at the Wright Museum. I'll see a museum, you know, and it's like, oh, gotta write that down, gotta research that, you know, and suddenly it becomes a story. So yeah, that's where A Love Not Forgotten came from. And I'm a, I'm a big sucker for second chances. I don't know why, but whether it's romance or one of my very good friends, the first time I met her, it's like, ooh, who is this woman? I mean, she was very over the top and very, very over the top. And it was a little off-putting for me. And the second time I met her, I thought she is the most delightful person I've ever met. So I just love second chances. That's awesome. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about uh, the characters themselves? So how about Allison? Like, um, so what is she doing um, during the like the war and and afterward? So the um, most of the women went to work for the defense industry because that's where the money was made. Mm -hmm. um, but Allison had family that was serving and as much as that was great, you could be in the defense industry she wanted something different than that and was drawn to the land and realized that by you know planting these acres worth of potatoes you know she's potentially sending food to her brothers who are you know serving and it's it's a it's a more personal way yeah. to serve her family rather than you know stuffing bullets or building bombs or or that sort of thing um and so she um she ends up uh choosing to do that and uh ends up working with a variety of people interestingly in the u.s they were not as enamored with the idea of the women's land army and they actually started using prisoners before they wanted to use women they're like well let's use the prisoners and not the women and you know just so interesting and britain was like no, we got farm people, we got farm ladies. Mm -hmm. you know, they're all over this. So um, so yeah, she um she decides that she's gonna help uh with the women's land army. That's awesome. And yeah. in the blurb, it shows that Chaz was shot over enemy territory, like he was shot down. I'm assuming his yes, like he's a pilot. Yeah, or the Royal, yeah, Royal Air Force. Yeah. And so is he still overseas or is he back in England when he has his amnesia? Uh, so he is back in England. So he did, he was shot down, but he managed to escape and uh, make it through one of the, the escape routes through uh, Europe and ends up back in England and is in a rehab hospital. Um, but he has lost his um, identity discs. So they have no idea who he is. He can't remember um, who he is. And he's all he's got is this letter and there's it doesn't come with an envelope. He has been carrying it in his uniform pocket, um, but that's the only thing he's got. And it's just got this one name and not even a last name. So um, so it's the mystery of trying to find out. Trying to find each other. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. Great. So um, now is this one in a series or is it just a, like a standalone book? So Allison is a secondary character. Um, I wrote a series called Wartime Brides, and it it is four biblical stories that have been now set in World War II. So Love's Harvest is the story of Ruth set during World cool. War II. Yeah. What was cool. I like that. Again, research. <laughs> I needed a famine. I needed a famine that was going to get them to certain places. So I started out with a German woman who was in the 
Volga region of Russia and they end up with, and she's married to a Brit and blah, blah, blah. So, so um, Rose, who is the Ruth character, ends up in England on um, the Boaz character's farm and Allison works on that farm as well. So Allison is a secondary character of Love's Harvest. Um, the second book uh, was Love's Rescue that was set in France. Uh, and that's the story of Rahab and the two spies. Mm -hmm. uh, Love's Allegiance um, is uh, the story obscure. Two Hebrew women who saved the babies under Pharaoh. Yeah, um, so that is set in Germany. And because of what unfortunately was happening with the Jewish babies. So mm -hmm. I have it uh, set there. And then Love's Belief is, is um, Conscientious Objector. And that's Rebecca and Isaac. So those were very fun to that would out be to fun to them in World War Two, like to puzzle it in and and put all the pieces in to make the stories work together with the historical times. Yes, that exactly that takes talent. That's oh, thank. <laughs> that, I was, that. that was really interesting. And I am not a theologian. I mean, I am a believer, and I you know I study, but I you know I stayed away from anything potentially deep you know it was again it was the stories of of those folks so yeah so allison is a is a, a sequel slash offshoot of the one but they are technically standalones neat i like that a lot so do you write um just like christian romance or do you write in other genres uh so i started out writing mysteries because i couldn't figure out what to do with the plot <laughs> and when you have a mystery to solve, Eureka, you have a plot. Exactly. <laughs> and um, at the time I was running a bed and breakfast and in order to go to a um, writer's conference, it needed to be off season. So I started looking for mm -hmm. conferences from November to April. And I live in New Hampshire, which is about two hours north of Boston. And I uh, found the Sisters in Crime Crime Bake Conference that's located in Dedham. It's fantastic it is it is probably the best run conference i've i've ever been to whether it's a work conference i mean they it's a small conference there's only maybe 250 attendees something like that so it's very intimate mm -hmm. but it is every name you could imagine um I, yeah it's i mean i've rubbed elbows with the best of them i mean you know and Cleves and Hallie Efron and I mean just all of them and they are so down to earth and so ooh, what do you want to know about writing let me help you you know not oh yes I'm this big important mystery writer and aren't you glad that you've met me and let me autograph something for you you know that's so not them and the and the um the workshops are phenomenal so I started writing mystery because I was at a mystery writing conference um I wrote five all World War II, enjoyed them. Uh, three of them are a series of one amateur sleuth, um, the other two standalones. Um, but I found they weren't really working. And then I got asked to write a, a romance as part of a, a multi-author project. And I thought, all right, I'll give my hand at that. Um, and no pun intended, or maybe so, fell in love with writing romance. Um, I enjoy, I like I like the happily ever after. I mean, yes, in a mystery, there's the mystery is solved, but it's yeah. not the same concept as happily ever after. And I'm that's the kind of reader I am. I'm not. That's the kind of movies I watch. I don't watch. Um, I don't read literary fiction. I don't. You know. Um, I, I want the. I do. I want the happily ever after. So that's that's what I write. It yeah. goes again to to writing what you love. And sometimes we stumble on stuff and then we, we progress further and we, we find our niche in our, in our area, you know? Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. So um, what got you interested in writing? Oh, I've been writing since I was a kid. Um, I don't know. I don't think I can, <laughs> it's over on the other. So when I was about eight or nine, my folks gifted me with a, um, a pad of paper. I was, um, as my mother like you used to say, I was a busy child. So I think that translates into let's keep Linda out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
wonder what it does if I do this, you know? Um, and they must have seen imagination or something, but they gave me that pad of paper and said, and a package of pens and said, you know, why don't you try writing stories? And I did. And I, I mean, um, I, I still have that book and it's 50 plus years old. And it's, um, you know, what happened when the centipede gave a puppet show? Um, you know, Miranda, the toy elephant, uh, you know, and, and I found that that's kind of how I process life. Mm. Uh, so wrote all the way through elementary school, junior high, it kind of turned into, you know, angst ridden diary entries in high school. <laughs> a lot less I, think, I think we all go through that phase. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. That's really attractive. Um, and then unfortunately, um, life and trying to get a career going. So my writing ended up more business. Uh, as I said, I'm in HR. So it was employee newsletters and policies, and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then in 2002, we left the Washington, D.C. area to buy the bed and breakfast. And I decided to uh, journal the trip. And then when I got here, very serendipitously, I ended up falling into some freelance opportunities with magazines, several oh, travel and lifestyle. Yeah. Um, travel and lifestyle magazines. One in particular, which is no longer in publication was called New Hampshire to do. And it was, what are things to do here in New Hampshire? Well, when the editor found out I was a history nut, that's what she assigned it. So I did all of these articles about towns in New Hampshire, and it was always the history of, and, you know, we were founded in 17, whatever. I mean, we had a royal governor, you know, I mean, a lot of history. So, so I got into that, did that for probably six years. And then the itch it was like, yeah, fiction, you know, I think I need to go back to fic. You know, this is great. I'm going to keep at it. Um, and I thought, what the heck, I'm going to try my hand back in fiction. And then that's when I wrote the great American novel. No, uh, <laughs> got a lot of very politely worded uh, rejections. And then Rebecca Germany at Barber wrote the nicest two page. Who has time to do that? Two page. Pages. Right. Rejection saying, here's what I see in your writing. Here's where you need improvement. This is what I suggest, you know, including going to to uh, conferences and whatnot, you know, and best of luck to you. And, you know, would love to have you uh, submit should you decide to in the future. I mean, but the fact that she took that kind of time and effort. It gives you hope and well, it gave it, you constructive, you know, steps. Well, and it allowed the seed to be watered instead of squashed, yeah. instead of you know, and again, I mean, I got a rejection that looked like the guy had written it on the bottom of a three ring piece of paper and then torn off the paper so he could oh. use the other part of the paper to write somebody <laughs> else a rejection. I mean, it was horrible. It was horrible. You know, so it's know. a hard industry sometimes. It's very, it's very, yes, you have to be somewhat thick skinned. So, so she really, I have her to thank to, to say, okay, with some training, I can do this. And that's when I started going to conferences and reading books and magazines and, and whatnot. Um, so, so yeah. Are you, are you uh, traditionally published then, or are you now an indie publisher or are you hybrid? between? I am a two? hybrid author. Yep. I'm a hybrid author. So uh, my mysteries are, most of my mysteries, not all of them are traditionally published. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of my romances were traditionally published. And then I got the rights back. This one is one of those. A Love Not Forgotten was part of an anthology put out by a, a small publisher. And then after five or six years, um, sales started to dry up for them. And it probably wasn't worth it to keep it on their calendar or their catalog. So they, they reverted the rights to all of us um, authors. And we went ahead and indie published it. So mm -hmm. um, probably 70% of my stuff is, is indie. I love the control. <laughs> spoiler <laughs> alert i'm a control freak uh, so, i love so what about the control do you love like what so they do you so enjoy? When traditionally published um first of all it's if you're lucky it's 10 months between when they say yes and when your book hits the shelves mm. um i don't like to wait um 
and also um, input. You know, they're like, here's your cover. Well, can I give you some input? No, not really. You know, this is the cover we think is going to sell your book. And that's our job is to sell your book. Yeah. Um, and um, with the with one of my manuscripts and I went ahead and did it, but they there was a there was a lot of suggestion for changes. And. I don't know that it made the book better. I think it made it different. Mm -hmm. I wasn't crazy about it, but again, it was early enough in my career that I loved being, you know, traditionally published. And so was willing to go along with that. Um, so I, so I like the speed with which I can release with, with just doing it myself. Now I have a professional editor. I have a beta group that reads, I have a, you know, I work with professional, I pay to have my covers done professionally, but but I collaborate with that cover designer to, mm -hmm. you know, to, uh, to work with them, to help them come up with, and, and I have to learn it's harder. I have to keep up with genre trends. I have, you know what I'm saying? I mean, cover trends are totally different what they are now as opposed to what they were to even five years ago. Yes. So, you know, you have to keep up with that sort of thing. Um, so it's a little bit more challenging and I am, I'm a wide I'm split. I'm a wide author with all of my World War II stuff. Um, I have also written quite a few Mail Order Bride um, multi-author project books. Um, and those are novellas. It was very, I was honored to be asked by several other authors saying, I'm doing a project. Would you be part of that? I mean, you know, it's an honor to be nominated. <laughs> It's hard to turn that down. <laughs> it is. So I did quite a few of those. Those are all in KU, which is great, which is certainly fine. So it's, which as a businesswoman, I find works for me. You know, mm -hmm. again, all of my eggs are not in one basket. I love being in KU with certain things. And it's a, it's very specific. It's all my 1800s books and that, that works. Um, my World War II stuff is wide. So you can get me on Kobo and Barnes and Noble and Google Play and you know Apple Books, so just about anywhere, um, but that's more certainly more challenging because of having to upload it and keep sites, it. right? Right, right. Yeah. So, but yeah. but again, I think it's for me, it's a good business model to have my eggs spread out. Um, mm -hmm. Will because if anything ever happens to your Amazon account, you still have an income through your other stuff, right? Yes, exactly. And I am eventually going to sell direct by my website. Um, but that's kind of down the in, road in the future. Eh? <laughs> I've noticed that that is definitely a trend um, that is happening more and more lately that authors are, are taking even further control by selling direct from their website and cutting out the middleman entirely, right, whereas exactly. possible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, uh, it's a great idea. And again, it's, it's another avenue um, but you have to drive the people to your website. Yes. It's, they're not going to find you as a search engine, you know, no. for the most part. Um, so yeah, it involves a little bit more, but again, I, I love the challenging of figuring out how to do it and yeah. Yeah. I, I, I look forward to it. It's, it's a little, uh, it's a little nerve wracking thinking about it. So it's probably a year or more away, but yeah gives it gives people an, another opportunity for sure it definitely does and and it also i think would keep prices low for consumers while raising profit for the author themselves to keep you know be competitive and and still be able to like hopefully make a living at their books right sure. exactly yeah yeah, exactly. yeah. so that's yeah. interesting uh so what's your favorite thing about being an author well probably the research i <laughs> Love, love. I will not live long enough to write my stories because of I I research stuff and or I'm watching something and surprisingly, right? I watch 1930s and 1940s movies or things set in the 1930s and 40s, and I'm I'm always scribbling down ideas and I love the research aspect and just learning about these people that went before us and and highlighting the sacrifice they made, you know, like I said, even the women who didn't want to go to work, went to work, they sacrificed their family life because their country asked them to. And, 
And I find that really interesting, especially in today's mode of, as again, as an HR professional, I'm finding hiring very, very challenging um, mm -hmm. because this is going to sound awful, but the, the candidates want it to be all about them. Well, okay, I get that, but it's in some ways it's kind of all about me too as a company because I have yeah. I have a product to put out or a job to do or a and um all of where I work none of our jobs are remote it is all direct service we have a nursing home we have I mean it is you know it's not like you can remote in to take care of your residents um and it's very challenging especially since covid because people found remote jobs and they're finding they love that which is yeah. fantastic. I love that people can do that. You know, good for them. Bad for me, good for them. But it is very, and the labor pool is a lot smaller. You know, the boomer generation was massive. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're starting to phase out. Yep. The two generations yep. behind that are much, much, much smaller. So my labor pool is smaller. Um, yeah. So it's, it's very challenging right now, but I do, I enjoy the research aspect and I'm an outliner. So I know what's going to happen in the story before I even set the first chapter open. So you're a plotter then making yeah. your outlines and, and, and uh, scripting where you're going more or less. Right. Every now and then they wander off the page, but for the <laughs> most part, they stay put. Um, but that's me in my life. You know, I'm a list maker, mm -hmm. you know, um, so that's not real surprising. Do you have some uh, favorite authors that you would recommend that people read if they wanted to get into writing? So uh, you mean as far as people who write books about craft or actual uh, books about craft or if they're interested in like, let's say they're interested in writing um, maybe even historical fiction like you do. For... Okay. Okay. Um, there are so um Hallie Efron's book, How to Write a Mystery, is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It's it's for every, it's even for every, it's the three act and the and the black moment. I mean, but she does a great job of so mine has highlighting and arrows and you know. Um, so that's for any genre. Um, Victorine Liskey's book on how to write a swoon-worthy uh, romance is yeah. also excellent. Um again, what I love about her book, same as Hallie's, is she tells you, and then she shows you. She takes one of her books and uh, annotates. Says, "Okay, mm -hmm. this is where I did this, and this is why I did this, and this is this part, and this is this put." So you, so you see it in action and see it actually um, how to do it. So those have been my go-to. Um, there are a couple of books that are on the shelf behind me um, that I cannot remember the author, but there is one that talks about um, research. Um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's tricky because you research this much, but this is what ends up in your book. You cannot, you know, you don't want it being a textbook. You don't want it to be dry. You don't want it to be boring. Um, so you have to learn and that's the history because history readers know their history. Yes. So first of all, they're going to know if you mess it up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you better get it right. Um, but that's why they read it is to learn about it and to know it. Um, but H Heather Blanton writes incredible historical novels. Um, uh, Christy Cambron, um, they write phenomenal. You could probably read those and then outline and learn how to, you know, kind of outline their book and see how they've they've done it. Um, but their character development and their were their inclusion of historical information. Uh, I'll read it. If Heather wrote the phone book, it would probably be a page turner. She is a phenomenal writer. Just a phenomenal writer. Just a great communicator. Yes. Yeah. Um, her background, she was a journalist. Oh, um, that always I helps. Know that. I didn't know that until <laughs> recently. Yep, for sure. I don't. And Christy, that's actually her pen name. I believe she's a research librarian. Oh, okay. Her, Correctly. So again, makes sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, um, it's been wonderful speaking to you. The time has flown past. Thank you, it has, it has. <laughs> my my free sure version of Zoom is, is reminding me we're getting close to the end. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so it's been really wonderful. And, uh, you know, next time you have a new release, let me know. We'll have you on again. And okay. I'm going to put uh, your um, book link and the link to your website as well in the in the thank description so people can find it if they're interested. And thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Let me do a quick uh, pitch. The series I'm working on now is called The Resistance Chronicles, and oh, it's nice. going to be five siblings who were involved in a, the different resistance movements during World War II. Uh, the first book is about the Shetland bus. Mm -hmm. So they need to look that up. Very cool. Very, very cool. Um, I was going to say, if, if you need a little extra research, let me know, because uh, my uncles were in the Dutch resistance. Really? Yes. That's book three. Oh, okay, sweet. Put me in touch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know much, but I can tell you what little I know. <laughs> okay, that sounds like a plan. Great. All right. Well, thank you again for coming, and uh, I really appreciate it. All righty. Take care. You too. Thanks.